Okay, we're live. Jeff, good evening. We've good got evening, John. Andrew Grant with us tonight. Andrew, glad you could make it in. Uh, we'll uh, we'll keep going here for just a couple of minutes and give everybody a chance to connect with us because I don't have my intro built for this yet. I'm probably going to try to do that intro we have before I do this again. So we'll have a little 20 or 30 second buffer to give everybody a chance to get hooked up with us. But welcome back to another episode of Thirsty Thursday from the Man Cave. I'm John Setzler and we have Jeff Ledbetter here with us just like we do on Friday nights for our regular live stream with Man Cave Meals. Uh, Hank, Hank's with us tonight. Good evening. Uh, tonight we're going to talk about talk about beer. Last week we did what I call Bourbon 101, and I I shared some of my very novice uh, knowledge of bourbon with you guys, and talked a little bit about how I have gone through the process of learning to taste and learning to appreciate bourbon. And uh, tonight, I'd like to do the same sort of thing about with beer instead of bourbon. Uh, my background in beer is, is super extensive compared to my background with bourbon. Uh, I've only been into the bourbon scene for about a year and a half, but I've been into the beer scene for a really long time. I, I, I learned to homebrew. I learned to make my own beer. Uh, I think I started my homebrewing hobby. Uh, around 1993 or 94 and I did it all the way up until the point where I got interested in barbecue <laughs> and I didn't have room or time for both so I kind of gave up the home brewing hobby but first thing I want to do tonight is I'm going to have a beer I'm going to have uh this Trois Pistoles from a unibrow and we'll talk about that here in a minute I've got their website pulled up here this is uh uh, Unibrow is a uh, Canadian brewery out of Quebec, and they make some really amazing beers. And this is one of what I like to call their big guns. It's a it's a high gravity, fairly high alcohol. I think this is about a nine percent uh, alcohol. So I'm going to uh, get a pour of this into my pint glass here. It's been so long since I poured a beer. Let me see if I can get one with a with a decent head on it. I think we're doing okay. Heck yeah. So what we have here is a dark Belgian ale. And this is on par alcohol wise with a Belgian triple, somewhere between a Belgian triple and a, and a Belgian quad. Yeah, Fran, this is not keto friendly. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I've been out of ketosis for a couple of weeks, but I'm working on, I'm going to head back in to ketosis here very shortly. I need to work back at, work back at that again. But this Unibrow, I've got the website up here. Let me, uh, let me pull this up so we can have a quick look. This beer is, uh, I'll give you some of the notes here from their website. Uh, and 9%, 9 alcohol is part of their classic series. They call it a Belgian-style dark, strong ale. And this IBU number here that's listed at 15.5, what that what IBU is, is that stands for International Bitterness Units. And you can look at these numbers and get an idea of how bitter a beer might be. And a 15.5 is super low on the IBU scale. Your, your, your pale ale, your IPAs, and your really hoppy beers, that are so popular these days are up in the uh, 70 plus range on the IBU scale. They just go up from there. This SRM color, this SRM number down here refers to the color. And they're just showing you here that this comes in two different bottle configurations. It comes in a 750 mil and then the, the 355 bottles. Um, there's another little chart here that talks about the, uh, the, the acidity and the bitterness, sweetness and spices, those we're going to talk about those elements of beer here shortly. If you're having a beer tonight with me, be sure and let me know what you're having. The tasting notes 
It says on the nose, a strong malt flavor, slightly roasted with aromas of chocolate, brown rum, spices, and herbs. The flavor notes are full-bodied palate with notes of lightly smoked rum, grains, herbs, and spices. This this beer is spiced. I don't know exactly all of what what goes into this per particular beer, but it's uh, it's really good. It's uh, this is what I would call this is a dessert beer. This is not a, a, a light beer or this is this is kind of an after dinner beer, maybe. <laughs> Jeff, what would you call a beer with a, a heavy body? It's, it's not I don't know if I'd call it. I don't know this. You call this a dessert beer at, at nine <laughs> percent. Yeah. So. Hmm. Let's see. Anthony's with us. Uh, Anthony had a hazy little thing, IPA, earlier and then moved to red wine. VC France says, Canada, are you, what part of Canada are you in? Are you in Quebec? Are you anywhere near these uh, unibrow people? And Andrew here is from Nova Scotia. Levi, glad you could make it. Scott's having a turbo dog. Okay. Sierra Nevada Pale Ale from Bud. That's that's a that's a house favorite. That's that is a solid, really good pale that's, ale. That's a good beer. That's a good beer. It, that one's been around for a long time, and that was that a Sierra Nevada Pale Ale's been around in, in the terms of the pale ale world. I like to call it kind of a grandfather. It kind of started uh, what became what became a trend here in the United States with hoppy beers and the, the Sierra Nevada pale ale is not particularly hoppy, but it's, it starts to edge forward with the hops and, uh, Sierra Nevada makes several Sierra Nevada's torpedo is a really good, it's, I guess it's a, it's an Imperial IPA. Maybe I don't know exactly what the style differentiator is on that, but it's a really good beer. Uh, Levi's having the Bells too hearted. Bells makes great ales. Also, I am a huge fan of that Bells Oberon. It's a it's a citrus laced uh, Hefeweizen that's just amazing. All the Bell, Bells comes out of Michigan. That's a uh, I don't I don't remember. Are they in Comstock, Michigan? What's the name of that town in Michigan where Bells comes from? I've got one of their. Here's here's how. Here's how you know I like I, I back up what I said about the Oberon. I've got one of their glasses <laughs> for the Oberon. I, I, I have a lot of pint glasses for different beers, and uh, I've got a couple of really special glasses that I don't get to pull out very often. And here's one of them. And hopefully we're going to see this one in action sometime before long. We'll get some Westies in here and uh, have some tastings. So Kalamazoo, Michigan. Kalamazoo. Okay. Yep. Bells. Bells makes a lot of good beers, but I am a huge fan of that Oberon. That Oberon, as we move into the warmer months, I'm going to talk about beers when we do this. I'm going to have beers that I think are seasonally appropriate. This beer I'm having tonight is not seasonally appropriate. <laughs> this is not what I call summertime, late spring or summertime beer at all. But as I was telling Jeff before we started the live stream tonight, I took a trip down to my favorite place to buy beer in my hometown just a few miles down the road here earlier today and I was devastated. I hadn't been in there in quite a while because as you know I've been doing keto and I haven't been drinking beer. I've been drinking bourbon instead and uh, I was devastated when I walked in this place and found out that they're closing their doors next week. They're not going to, my favorite place to buy beer is closing up so they didn't have, I went in there to get a good Belgian ale. I wanted to get, I wanted to find a uh, a nice Belgian or a uh, Saison or a French farmhouse ale or something like that to start this with because those are some of my favorites. So I ended up with this Tropistolis because it was basically the only thing they still had left in their coolers that I wanted and that I was interested in at all. So I got a four pack of that. The good news is, is it's 25% off. I paid I paid ten dollars and change out the door for a four pack of that, which is pretty good. So, uh, Levi says he likes the Oberon, but I'll, I, I'll get the Oberon going. Uh, in the summertime, I like lighter colored beers and I like 
I like I, I call those beers lawnmower beers. They're beers that you can drink while you're mowing the grass. You can drink them all day long and not get drunk because they don't have a lot of alcohol. They're four to four and a half percent, five percent maybe, and uh, call them a session beer. It's a beer that you can drink uh, continuously without having to worry about uh, losing your cognitive abilities in the process, which is not the case with something like this Tropistolis. So let me move forward here, Jeff. We're going to talk a little bit about how beer is made, kind of like we did with bourbon. Uh, what I did, guys, is I, I went through some of my videos. I've got a video series on the Man Cave Mills YouTube channel of how to make beer from scratch using the all grain process. So what I've done is I've done a few screen captures from this video series to give you an idea how beer is made. Beer has four main ingredients in it, and the first ingredient is water, as you see here. The second ingredient is malted barley, and what's what you see here, the color is horrible in these pictures, and I apologize for that. These are really old pictures. Uh, this is a, reg, a standard two-row two row malted barley that's uncracked. It's not quite ready to go into the process yet, but that's one of the four that's the second ingredient. The third ingredient is hops. And when I make beer, I always use hops in the pelletized form rather than the leaf form. It's easier, just easier to deal with for me. And it, the, you get better extraction of the hops, I think, from the pelletized. And the fourth ingredient is yeast. So you're asking yourself, how can you get all these different beer styles out of just four ingredients? Well, let me back up here for a moment. The all of the beer styles, the, the body and bulk of the flavor in beer comes from the malts that are used. And this is a basic uh, malt here. Uh, this is what I like to call a base malt. This, this particular malt in this picture is a Maris Otter uh, base malt. It's a, it's a light colored malt. But when you're making beer, your malt, your beer, your grain bill, as I would refer to it, is a mixture of, of a base malt with a lot of other types of malt. And these malts get kilned, they get toasted, they get roasted, which uh, produces uh, darker colors. It produces caramelization and a whole variety of different flavor profiles come from the various levels of, of kilned and roasted malts. Some of the malts that are used to make beer are black in color. They're, they're so roasted, they bring a dark coffee color and a deeply roasted flavor. So the color in the beer that you're drinking comes from the, the, the different types of malts that go into that. So the hops that go in beer provide two different characteristics based on when the hops are introduced to the process. Hops offer bittering for the beer, and the, the purpose of bittering is to counter all the sweetness that comes from the, the malted barley. And the second purpose of the hop is for aroma. And we'll, we'll talk about the different hop additions in the process as we go here. But this is a picture of my green mill. Uh, in order to prepare that malted barley, you have to crack the, the shell on it so water can get to the inside of that. And this, this uh, barley crusher grain mill that I have, it came with a hand crank and it's really tedious work to crank 14 or 15 pounds of malt through that thing by hand. But this thing, you could take the handle off and hook a 3 8 inch drill to it and run through your barley really quick and get it cracked and ready to go. So all of the different grains that are going in my recipe for any beer get run through the grain mill to crack those grains open. You don't pulverize them. You just kind of crack it. And you kind of see here in the bucket, I didn't give a close-up picture of this of what that looks like after it comes through the mill. But the next thing you do is called the mash. And the purpose of the mash is just like a mash for a uh, bourbon, you're going to soak those grains in hot water. And for, for beer purposes, my water temperatures for my mash 
or my not just the water temperatures, the total temperature for the mash when you put the grain in runs anywhere between 150 degrees and 160 degrees Fahrenheit, depending on what type of beer you're making. The temperature of the mash uh, determines what happens. The, the starches that exist inside the cracked malted barley, uh, when that's introduced to warm water at these temperatures, though, there's enzymes in there that convert those starches to fermentable sugars. And different types of fermentable sugars get converted based on the temperature of this mash. So I'm putting water into what is a homemade mash tun here made out of a, a water cooler that's hotter than, than that because when I dump my grains in there, it's going to cool off and you, you want that to settle in. Typically, I'm mashing at 152 degrees and there are some formulas you use. I'm not going to get too deeply into the science of, of mashing, but based on your, your ambient temperature of your grain and how much of it you've got and how much water you use, and there's some formulas to figure out what that water temperature needs to be in order to get it to settle in at your proper temperature. And this mash process goes for 60 to 90 minutes or so, depending on what you're what you're doing. So after you get the hot water in, you dump your you dump your cracked grains in there and stir it up. And then I had I don't I don't have I didn't save a picture of this one, but I had a piece of foam that I pushed down over the top of that and then put the lid on my my mash tun cooler there and just let it sit from that point to let the uh, enzymes do their work on those starches, which I said takes 60 to 90 minutes. And when that process is done, you drain the liquid out and you leave the uh, the shells and husks and all the solids behind. So what I'm doing here is just I'm, I'm doing this. I'm running it out of the bottom. There's a false bottom in this cooler, which allows the uh, the liquid to run through and it holds all the solids back. And I run that till it runs clear and then I run it into my boiler kettle. And uh, actually you do this several times after after I drain that off the first time, I put additional hot water into that mash tun to get, we want to get all of that sugar out of there. And it takes a good bit of water to run through there to get it. And on this particular brewing session, I'm, I'm shooting for a 10 gallon batch of beer. So I'm going to end up with about 13 or 13 and a half gallons of water in the initial boil because we're going to boil it. And during the process of boiling, it's going to reduce down and uh, it's going to create what I'm going to tell you about. It's called gravity. It's going to be how much fermentable sugar we have in that uh, wort is what this is called, W-O-R-T. So after that's done, you put it on the boiler. And I had a boiler here. My, my brew kettle was made out of an old beer keg. I cut the top out of that beer keg and polished that edge off where it's not sharp and used that as a boiler. And I put a, a ball valve in the bottom of it where we can drain it off nicely. But the boil process typically lasts about an hour, depending on what your what your uh, targets are and what your volumes are. But ultimately, you're looking for a specific gravity. And there's a there's a tool that I have called a hygrometer that uh, you can float in this, and it tells you what your gravity is. And you're looking for a specific starting gravity to to make your style of beer. You know what that starting gravity needs to be that concentration of sugar in this wort in order for the yeast to ferment it down to whatever your target alcohol content is for that beer style. So we get the boil started and then we add hops. And I just dumped some of those pelletized hops into this. The hops that go in at the beginning of the boil are bittering hops. They're in the boil for the whole time. They're in there and uh, they, they provide bitterness. And Hops can be added anywhere throughout the boil process, but typically in the stuff I made, uh, I was adding some at the beginning and then I was adding some more at the very end. At the very end of the boil, the hops are only in there long enough to provide aroma, an aromatic character of the beer rather than uh, any bitterness. So after the boil is complete and you're at the gravity, you've got the, the sugar concentration that you want in that you need, it has to be cooled quickly. So I had built, uh, this is called an immersion chiller, which is a bunch of copper tubing that I'm going to run uh, 
water through it. It's got hose connectors on each side of it where I can pump tap water through that and have it drain out the other side. And this, this immersion chiller, even in the summertime, tap my tap water here is fairly warm in the summertime. It's 75 degrees or so. And, uh, the, the target is, is you want to get this down below 100 degrees Fahrenheit as quickly as you can. And with a chiller like this, this particular chiller was made from 50 feet of 3 8 inch inside diameter copper tubing. So I could cool that, that work from boiling down to below 100 degrees in about 10 or 12 minutes with this chiller design and uh, get it cool enough to move on to the next step, which is running... Uh, running that off into my fermentation buckets. So that's what's happening here. I've got a piece of uh, plastic tubing on there and I'm just running that off into the fermentation buckets. And once again, we're trying to leave all of our solids behind. The only solids that are really in this are the, are the, the hops that, that are there. A lot of people won't, a lot of people will take their hops and instead of dumping them straight in, like I do, they'll put them in a, in a mesh bag to where it's easier to keep them out. But it, to me, it's not a big deal one way or the other, because even if some of that does get into your fermentation bucket, it's all going to settle to the bottom along with yeast and whatnot that's coming next. So this particular batch, I'm making 10 gallons and there's, there's a little over, there's probably about five to five and a quarter gallons in each of these buckets right here. And as you can see, this bucket, this one's got a different lid on it at the moment, but there's an air hole here where we're going to put an airlock later. But at this point, when the, when the beer temperature's down, I usually let my beer temperature, my work temperature get down below about 80 degrees before I put the yeast in it. And then I'm going to aerate that, or actually I aerate it, which I didn't show here before I put the yeast in because of the yeast, the oxygen mixture in the beer uh, is good for the yeast in the beginning. It helps that yeast get going. So then I put the airlocks on and these are little, uh, cheap plastic airlocks that you can put water in or a lot of people put vodka in it instead of water and it allows gases to escape from the bucket without allowing gases back in and this fermentation process is just like any other fermentation the yeast is consuming the sugar from that work and the byproduct of that consumption is alcohol and carbon dioxide so the act, the full fermentation process for this takes seven to 10 days on average, but there's a lot of other things going on there in terms of clarification of the beer. So I would typically let mine go for seven to 10 days. And if it's, if it was something I was really serious about, if it was a beer, I was really serious about the clarity and the overall appearance of once that primary fermentation is complete, I would drain this wort out into another bucket and leave all the sediment behind and put another airlock on it and let it go for another two or three weeks just because that's the way I like to do it. And it, it makes a clearer beer. It makes a prettier beer. And let me back up one step here. Uh, one of the things I wanted to talk about in this process is there are two kinds of beer in terms of fermentation. What I'm making here is an ale, and there are ales and lagers. I don't want to forget about my beer while, while I'm running my mouth. Jeff, you got to stop me. <laughs> I'm like a freight train when I get started talking. But one of the common questions people will ask is, well, what's the difference between an ale and a lager? The difference is how they're fermented. The ingredients are all the same. There's no different ingredient, but ales are fermented at room temperature or warmer for shorter periods of time. And it's called, it's a process called top fermentation. What happens with these ale yeasts is they rise to the top and they do all their work at the top. And as the yeast dies, they, they fall out and settle to the bottom and these yeasts, uh, these different yeasts for different, there's a lot of different yeast you use for different beer styles. And each of these yeasts has its own characteristics. And some yeasts are more alcohol tolerant than others are. But as the alcohol content comes up in these beers, the yeast start to die off. And that's one of the things that 
keeps beer from being 20% alcohol <laughs> instead of whatever's the yeast, the yeast you're fermenting them with uh, dies out. But a lager is, is, is cold fermented. Uh, there, the fermentation temperatures for lagers are usually down around 40 degrees Fahrenheit and they ferment from the bottom. The, the lager yeasts go to the bottom and they work from the bottom. Other than that, there's no difference in these beers. So uh, certain styles of beers by their traditional style are lagered rather than uh, uh, ales. They're, they're fermented with the lagering process rather than the ale process. So we'll talk about certain beers that are done that way later when, whenever we're talking about a specific beer. But uh, that's the difference between an ale and a lager. So uh, I see Glenn's with us. Andrew asked why vodka and uh, why vodka in the uh, in the airlock. And some people the, the thing about beers is uh, beer every one of the things I haven't mentioned here that a very important part of home brewing is all of this equipment has to be extremely well sanitized before you uh, start working with it. Uh, everything that went after the boil after the boil process in the beer, anything that that beer touches needs to be completely sanitized. I used an acidic uh, sanitizing solution on these buckets before I put this word in there to make sure there's nothing alive, no uh, wild yeast that could overpower my beer yeast and create what's called an infection in the beer. And it's something that's gonna create off flavors and whatnot. And some people like to put vodka in their airlocks just to create that extra level of protection from nasties. I don't really think too many nasties can get in through the airlock, but people wanna try, wanna use vodka there just as a precaution because nothing alive is going to survive through that vodka. But this picture here is this is what what it looks like in the bucket when the fermentation's complete. You can see this crud that's built up around the uh, top edge of the bucket. That's yeast sediment that's left from all that vigorous fermentation that was going on. Once you put that yeast in there and put that airlock on, uh, there's visible bubbling in that airlock within eight to 12 hours usually, and it gets very vigorous. And it goes on for uh, very vigorously for two or three days before it starts to slow down. And uh, I wish that I had done this with a glass carboy instead of these plastic buckets, because when you've got it in glass where you can see what's going on, that the the beer that's fermenting inside that glass, you can see it, it churning in there. It's very uh, good. What you got, Jeff? Take a drink. Take a drink. <laughs> okay, good deal. Mm. Yeah, I got to make sure I finish that. It's, this is delicious, by the way. And for those of you that are just joining in, uh, or if you joined in late, I'm having this uh, Trois Pistoles from Unibrow tonight. It's a really good, a really good dark Belgian ale. <laughs> Jeff, what are you drinking? Did I even ask you what you were drinking before we started? What you got there? Tell us about it. It's a uh, Belgian uh, lager. It's got a nice How's light it to taste? it. Good. Is it, a, Good. is it a light colored beer? Yeah. Yep. I don't know. It's hard to tell. And I don't ever drink beer from the bottle. Jeff, you need to get a pint glass. <laughs> Not, I got those out in the other room. I got to yeah. wash them. Bottle I don't have to wash. <laughs> oh. All right. Anyway, that's what the fermented beer looks like. This beer now, the alcohols, the alcohols there, and this, the yeast has consumed all of the sugars that it's going to consume from this, uh, from this work or this beer at this point. So, what do you do with it now? Okay. In my case, we got to bottle it because I never got into kegging and uh, I didn't want to spend the money and I didn't want to deal with kegs and I didn't want to buy a special refrigerator for kegging. I just didn't want to get into that. So if you're kegging your beer, that what you have here can go straight into your kegs. 
because you're going to you're going to carbonate that beer by pressurizing those kegs with carbon dioxide. So when you're too cheap and too lazy to do that process like I was, you have to bottle your beer. So like I said, the yeast had consumed all of the sugar from that beer that it was going to consume. However, there's still some active yeast in that work that, that can, can, can consume more sugar if some more sugar is added. So what I need to do now is I need to put this stuff in the bottles, but if I'm going to put it in the bottles, I've got to be able to get carbonation to it. And this, this carbonation process, what I'm doing here in this picture is I'm mixing in a little bit of corn sugar with some uh, water. I've got hot water boiling there. I'm adding a little bit of corn sugar to that because we're going to add some, some corn sugar water to our fermented beer. So when we put it in the bottles, there's a, enough additional sugar going on in there that the yeast can consume some more of that sugar creating a small amount of additional alcohol and a good bit of additional carbon dioxide. And once that lids on that bottle, that additional carbon dioxide production is going to carbonate the beer in the bottle so you don't have flat beer to drink. So in this picture here, I am siphoning my beer out of the, the fermentation bucket into a clean bucket that I'm going to use for bottling. And there's a good bit of sediment on the bottom of this bucket also, and I want to leave all that behind. I don't want to, I want to get as little of that into my bottling bucket as possible because I want my beer to be nice and clear. So I'm, I'm working that here. And then once I have the beer in the bottling bucket, I have this bottling attachment for a piece of plastic tubing that's got a spring loaded tip on the bottom of it. So I just open the valve on my bottling bucket that this plastic hose is connected to. And then I stick that tip into my bottle and press down on it. And when I press down on it, the spring opens up and it allows beer to flow into this bottle. And what I do is I don't have a good picture of this either, but when that beer gets all the way to the very top of that bottle, I pull up on my bottling tube. And when I pull the bottling tube out, it, the beer recedes into the bottle and creates a perfect amount of headspace for, for the carbonation to work properly. And that, that tends to work perfectly on 12 ounce bottles, 16 ounce bottles and 22 ounce bottles. And those are the three bottle sizes I typically used when I was bottling beer. So at this point, I'm running all of that beer into the bottles. And then the next thing I do is cap the bottles. I really like using these Grolsch style bottles with these uh, swing top caps. And those made it real easy to cap a bottle. These gaskets here, I would buy replacement gaskets and I would replace those gaskets after each one had been used three or four times with the new one because those gaskets don't last forever, but the bottles do and the caps do. And these bottles are also, they get cleaned and sanitized between uses as well. I use bottles over and over again, but when I wasn't using a growth style bottle, I have a bottle capper and I would buy caps. And uh, this, this little tool here, I don't have a, you'd have to go back to my video to see this in, in action, but this uh, tool puts the cap down on the bottle and crimps it on there where you've got a nice, good, tight, tight seal on that. And this is, this is just a picture of what I bottled in that particular production run. I bottled some, some 12, 16 and 22 ounce bottles there. And there's, there's a handful of growth style bottles here at that point. I didn't have a whole lot of them, but, uh, actually in the background over here, you can see another brew going in a clear bottle. That's a, that's a, a different uh, product. That's not beer. That's a, a, an apple wine that I was working on. But this is what that bottle, look, that process produced. And I typically, when I would do a 10-gallon batch where I would get a yield of 10 gallons, that's approximately four cases of beer, approximately 48 12-ounce bottles from a 10-gallon from, from process. That's what I like. I like to do 10 gallons at a time simply because it's not really much more work to do 10 gallons than it is to do five gallons. The only additional 
time involved and that's in the bottling process. It takes twice as long to bottle it, but that whole bottling process right there takes less than an hour to, to do all that. And it's a really fun hobby, but it's not for everybody. It's really not. <laughs> and I'm, I'm not trying to solicit you guys to, to get into home brewing. I'm just trying to give you an idea of what's involved in making beer. This is all done on a commercial scale. Is it time to drink, Jeff? <laughs> well, I think that's the end. Or no, the last picture here is I'm going to show you what that particular beer looks like. And once again, I don't have good pictures because these are clips from, these are screen grabs from videos I shot. And this is what that, that beer looked like. That, that particular beer was a little hazy. Uh, but that beer was also a, a wheat beer and a wheat beer when it's served is going to be a little hazy because you know what, when I told you we were adding a little bit of sugar back to that water before we bottled it, there's a little extra fermentation that's going to happen in the bottle to create that carbonation. And that creates homebrew beers all have a little bit of sediment on the bottom of the bottle. And a lot of craft beers, a lot of commercial beers will too, depending on the way they're they're doing it. And for a Hefeweizen, which is what this beer was, when you get, when you're, when you're pouring that, when you get down to the bottom of the bottle, I think it's important to swirl that bottle and stir up that sediment that's on the bottom of the bottle. And that needs you to go into your glass because part of the characteristic of a Hefeweizen is that yeast flavor. It's, uh, it's, if you've ever had a good Hefeweizen, some of those those yeasts produce a flavor and a slight aroma that's kind of like bubble gum in a way. And if you put that, get that sediment into your glass, it enhances that and it brings a, it brings a, uh, a real unique flavor and aroma to that beer. And it's part of that style of beer. So, uh, there's, there's a quick lesson on home brewing, or not necessarily just home brewing. In commercial brewing, all that's done on the same scale. It's done the same way, but it's just done on a huge scale. Everything's, uh, there's a whole bunch of uh, automation in that, and a lot of, a lot of automation. <laughs> so, you know, some of these breweries are doing this on huge scales, you know. Uh, the, the American beer market, what I call the American light lagers, your Bud Miller Coors genre beers don't have a whole lot of the uh, malted barley. They've got some malted barley in there, but there's a fifth ingredient in those beers, which is rice. They're using rice as an adjunct for their starches that get converted to sugars. And it's an, it's an inexpensive method. And it, it produces very light colored beers. Uh, I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with that. And I, when you look at beers that are sold here in the United States, those beers outsell everything else. <laughs> there's, there's not the beer connoisseurs aren't necessarily drinking Budweiser as much as they might be drinking Tropistolis or something else. But you know, we're beer. We could be beer snobs. We can be bourbon snobs, or we can uh, just go to the party and drink what's available. You know. <laughs> so, Jeff, what's one of your favorite kinds of beer? I love you, Englings. I'm sorry. England, I like, England. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I like you, England. And I like it when they, uh, yeah, I like it when they do their uh, seasonal, like the chocolate and the pumpkin. Those are good, good tasting. Yeah, Levi says he's brewed a few times and uh, I lo he loves the smell of the fermentation. Levi, in my experience with home brewing, the aroma of the boil is crazy <laughs> i love the smell of the work boiling and uh the 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 malt the malts coming together there it, it's like cereal it's almost it's like it's got a cereal smell to it it's really good uh i used to love the aromas the the aromas in the bottling let's see the smell of the fermentation. You know, I don't know how much how much aroma I really got from fermentation because I would I would put my fermentation in in the in a, an enclosed area in my basement back here where the furnace is, where in the air conditioner pump where the 
temperature stays about 65 to 66 degrees in that room year round, which is a really good temperature for fermentation of an ale. You know, some people like it warmer. You can do it warmer, 80 degrees, up to 80, 85 degrees even. But uh, fermentation temperatures also change the characteristics of your beer. If, you, if, if any of you guys are interested in getting into home brewing, PM me, send me a message. There, there's a book out there. Uh, there's this guy named Charlie Papazian that, that has written the, uh, I think it's called The Essential Guide to Home Brewing or The Home Brewer's Companion is what it's called. It's a really great book, and you can learn absolutely everything you need to get started in homebrewing in this one book, and it's really well written. Uh, there's tons of good books out there, but anything by Charlie Papazian is something you'd want in your library. Uh, there's another piece of there's a piece of software out there that helps you formulate your own beer recipes for styles, uh, and it's called uh, Brewsmith. It's a it's it's a really inexpensive application. I don't know if there's a phone app for it. It's a PC based app that I used to use for to help me formulate recipes and formulate grain bills for specific styles of beer. Uh, I like a lot of different beers. There's there's so many different styles of beer I like. I've only had a handful of styles of beer that I don't like. And most of those are these. I don't even know if they fit a real style guide with some of these incredibly hoppy beers that they're making here in the u.s these days like we talked about before hop hoppy beers people they have a cult following they're kind of like chili heads you know you got people that like the hotter is better with chili peppers like you got people growing these scorpions what are they called jeff the i know the ghost peppers and these these your mic's off again but the ghost peppers, scorpions. Yeah, I'm trying to keep the yeah. air conditioner noise down. But they, uh, you got these uh, crazy hot peppers, and I don't know people. People like bitter beers. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna complain about people that like bitter beers. But it's a, it's a big trend here, and it's just not my not my jam. I like the malty beers, and this particular beer right here has got a great heavy, great thick malt backbone to it, and uh, I love it. I've all of the unibrow beers that I've had is that's one of the few breweries out there where I like everything I've had from them. And I've had almost every brew that they make uh, at one time or another. They've got uh, a Belgian triple called La Fin du Monde, <laughs> which is French for the end of the world. <laughs> and it's crazy. It's good. Uh, but I like Belgians, and you'll see. We'll, we're going to talk a lot about Belgians lately, or, or in future episodes when we talk about beer, because the Belgians are some of my favorites. And uh, in fact, that reminds me once again, I need to get an order placed with that company that ships the West Wetterans here into the U.S. I'm going to get I'm going to get myself one of each of those, and I'll we'll feature all three of those on on there. Jeff likes Shinerbach. Jeff Duckworth, glad to have you with us tonight. Jeff's a homeboy here. He he lives down the road from me. I, I actually finally got to meet Jeff. Uh, I ran into Jeff at a Dick's Sporting Goods over here in town not long ago. It's good to meet him. Jeff makes barbecue smokers, and he, he does a lot of great things with barbecue, but Shinerbach's a staple down in Texas. That's made somewhere in Texas, and it's it's huge down there. It's good beer, too. I, don't, I like it, so... Uh, but hmm. get that drink, John. Let's put the chili in the beer. Heck yeah! I've made lots of flavor. I've made lots of flavored beers. One of the very first beers I made was a cherry stout, and it was it was good. I've put I've I've flavored beers with strawberry. I've I've used cinnamon. I've used orange peel is a common ingredient that a lot of people like to. Uh, seasoned beer with, especially if you're going to make a light colored summery, summer ale, a citrus, uh, citrus note in those beers is really good. But beers, uh, beers get, I've had beers that have had a nutmeg spice in them. I've had beers that have had a clove spice to them. Um, there's a lot of them that I do like. And this, this one's spiced. I just don't know what all goes in it. It says here on the bottle, 
ale brewed with spices and it says bottle refermented and that bottle refermented means that they carbonated this the same way I carbonated mine. They carbonated it in the bottle. It was not carbonated and then put in the bottle. And there's just a, a tab left in there with that, uh, that sediment. I didn't mix that in, in for this one before I poured it. But beer is a totally different animal. Uh, than, than the bourbon. It's, uh, once again, it's an acquired taste, just like the bourbon. We talked about that when we talked about learning to taste it. I can, I can remember some of the very first times I tasted beer. I said, who the hell can drink that? And the more you taste it and the slower you taste it, the better it, the better it gets, which brings up one other thing I wanted to mention. This is a this is a high gravity beer. This is a nine percent beer. So the thing, higher gravity beers taste better at warmer temperatures. Somewhere on that on that website, which I don't know if I still got it up. I do here. Let's let's look. This talks about. It says here, serve at fifty four to fifty seven degrees Fahrenheit. That's uh, mine's not quite that temperature. Mine was a little cooler than that, but higher gravity beers serve better and they taste better when they're a little warmer than refrigerator temperature. It's just like the example I, I, I probably gave somewhere in the past about eating a frozen pastry. You don't eat pastries frozen. You, you eat them at room temperature or you warm them up to enhance the flavor. Beer is the same way. And like I was telling Jeff a minute ago, I never drink beer out of the bottle. I like to drink beer out of a glass because there's several things I like about it. I get the opportunity to have the aroma with that wide mouth on this glass, and I get to enjoy the color and the appearance of the beer as well. But when you want, when you're having a high gravity beer that you want to serve at 55 to 60 degrees Fahrenheit. Keep that beer in the refrigerator at 37, 38 degrees, and then I brought this out to show you. This is my favorite pewter mug, and uh, when you pour that refrigerator cold beer into this pewter mug, within about two minutes or three minutes, I don't. This pewter mug will bring that beer up to that perfect temperature for uh, for a high gravity beer. This, uh, this mug comes from one of my local breweries. Uh, it's called the Old Hickory Tap Room. And I got this mug when, that, when they first opened. They were selling these mugs for $30 or $35 a piece. And uh, I bought one of these when they first opened up. And I've kept this because this is my go-to for high-gravity beers. If I want to pour, I don't get to enjoy the color of the beer through the glass with this pewter mug. But this is a 20-ounce pint instead of a 16 ounce pint and when you buy these mugs you could become a member of their mug club and they they'd engrave your name on the bottom of the mug and hang it up over the bar there were hundreds of these things up there and you had to know where yours was and you'd tell them and they'd get it And when you buy a pint you'd get a 20 ounce pint instead of a 16 ounce pint at the bar but yeah anthony listen to my podcast i check the man cave meals page guys i i, I joined in on a I was invited to be the first guest on a new podcast that a friend of mine's producing here. We talked about barbecue, so that's uh, I might bring that up tomorrow night when we talk about the uh, talk about the live talk about that live stream. Mountain time beer, Wesley. Can you get mountain time beer where you? I'm I'm not familiar with mountain time. Is that in Cashiers, North Carolina, Wesley? I, I'm not familiar. There's a lot of breweries in North Carolina now. They're, they're, they In the last 10 years, I don't know how many breweries have popped up here in western North Carolina. He says it's a lager in North Carolina. I, I'm not familiar with that one, but uh, I'll keep my eyes open for it. Uh, there's a lot of popular breweries. and You know, Sierra Nevada has an operation here in North Carolina now. They're, they're brewing here uh tanya and i've been to that brewery several times and I, we took the tour and they have a tap room where you can get bar food and beer 
and they've got a really great gift shop up there. It's a really beautiful campus. I think they've got some mountain biking and hiking trails on that campus as well. I couldn't get them to give me a, a sampling of their yeast that I could ferment with, though. They've got a yeast strain that's proprietary to to uh, Sierra Nevada that they don't they don't want to share. <laughs> I wouldn't either. So, you know, that's part of what makes Sierra Nevada unique. Sierra Nevada makes a lot of great beers. They, I don't like everything Sierra Nevada makes, but they, they've got a lot of good stuff. Jeff, are you a fan of any of the micro brews? Are there any breweries near you down in uh, Orlando? Yeah. Yes. We've got a, uh, a micro brewery out in, well, actually we've got several, but the, the one that I like is out in Winter Garden. Uh, was just west of here, right? It's a little small shop, and they've got uh, what, about four 250 gallon bats. Yeah, they brew different things, and yeah, they got some good stuff going on out there. That's definitely a microbrewery, that's a low, uh, a low output. But what this, I need to do one, I'll probably do a beer or two from my local brewery. This old Hickory Brewery was the first microbrewery in my area, and the guys that started that own two or three restaurants here in the area now as well. They've got the old Hickory Tap Room where this came from, and they've got the old Hickory Station. They bought the old uh, railroad station that exists in Hickory, North Carolina, and turned it into a beautiful restaurant and brewery. Well, they don't brew there, uh, but they've got, uh, they serve the brews from the, uh, from the brewery there and they've also got a fairly good beer selection they've got some of the belgian ales for sale in their cooler that i like so i'm probably gonna stop by there and get get some of those but if you've got a favorite beer style that you'd like to talk about uh bring it on and in fact i might try to get one of those guys uh jason or steven from the old hickory brewery they're their guys the i'll see if i might see if i can get one of them to come on live with us here one Thursday night and talk about it. Uh, I haven't thought about having uh, specific guests on this live stream yet, but I might be able to do that. I might be able to talk several people into coming on here with us and talking about beer and bourbon and whiskey. Tomorrow night on the Man Cave Meals live stream, I've got a new whiskey that we're going to have from Jack Daniels. I bought both of the new Jack Daniels whiskeys last week and I, I like both of them. I like one of them a little better than the other one. So we'll we'll bring out some Jack Daniels tomorrow night. So with that, I think we're gonna wrap up. I Hi John, I, I just happened yep. to take a look here for the Orlando area. I got twenty five breweries. Yeah. Within five They're miles. everywhere. They're everywhere. They're now. popping There's, up everywhere. Yep. Yeah. It's, uh, it's the designer thing to do. It is, and it's it's good. It's for people who love beer. They tip people who love beer typically. I don't know. I, this goes both ways because I know people who claim to be beer fans, and you know they've been drinking Bud Miller Coors all their life, and you put a microbrew in front of them that's a richer, fuller-bodied beer. They don't know what to think about that. They, some of them love it, and some of them say, oh, "I don't know about that." It's different. <laughs> From, from what they're used to. It's so, definitely opposite ends of the spectrum. They either love it or they don't. Yeah. Well, I need to be done for the night. I've got a lot to do tomorrow. So, guys, I appreciate you hanging out with us. Uh, we'll, we'll try to do this again in two weeks. This one will be two weeks out. I'm only going to do this one every other week uh, for the foreseeable future. And we'll, we'll toggle back and forth between uh, – booze and beer so next the next one we'll do we'll talk about booze again and i'll come up i'll figure out what we're going to talk about i don't know what it's going to be yet maybe we'll just do do a tasting i talked about jack daniels so maybe i'll line up uh some jack daniels to do some tasting see if we can talk about taste differences between some of the iterations of from the same distillery might be fun i've got old number seven i've got gentleman jack i've got single barrel select i've got the new bonded I've got the new triple mash bonded and I've got some barrel proof, uh, single barrel. How is that triple jet. mash bond, bonded that you just got? Uh, have you opened it yet? I have, I tasted it last night or, or was it last night or the night before 
it's not bad. It's not. I like the the black label bonded a little bit better, but the triple it's good. Don't get me wrong. Uh, it's very good, but it's. I, I think I'm. I like the uh, the standard mash bill better. The uh, the triple mash is a mixture of a malt a malted a malted mash bill or a barley. It's got the it's got some rye mash in it and some of the standard grain bill it's got three it's got a mixture of three different mashes they make so i don't really i don't really know much more about it than that it's 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 a good flavor it's just not my jam so much but i enjoyed it and oh. i'll uh, maybe i'll throw that bottle in the car when i come down uh when we get together next week in Atlanta, that'd be a good bottle to bring. And I'm going to, I'm going to go get a bunch of the little solo shot cups where I can share some tasting of this. I'll bring that down. So you, you can taste it. I'm, I'm, I've about, I've almost made up my mind to bring that old Fitzgerald down with me. I'm thinking very seriously about that. Uh, that's going to be a hard choice for me to make, <laughs> but I, I think yeah, I might. I may pick up a bottle of Elijah Craig to bring. Uh, but I'm going to bring, I'm going to bring down a bottle. I know I'm bringing a bottle of Eagle Rare and I know I'm bringing the E.H. Taylor. And, uh, so I'll bring that Jack triple mash and I'm thinking I may bring the uh, old Fitzgerald and, and share that around a little bit. That's uh, remember that's, we have to work a little too here. <laughs> well, this, yeah, we'll be done with the work by the, by Saturday night though. This is a Saturday night thing. Oh, okay. So, yeah, it'll be after we're done with the show, with the party. I wouldn't don't want to embarrass that. Gary. <laughs> well, yeah, I wouldn't dare do that on Friday night. <laughs> so, not before Saturday. So, uh, all right. If you have any questions, comments. Yeah, Andrew's talking about the Lafayne du Monde here. That that's a really good. Uh, that's a really good beer. It's great. It's one of my favorites. And he also says, what's your favorite beer to add when you cook brats? Uh, I typically use a, I, that's one case where I do like to use a hoppy beer. I'll throw in uh, for brats. I think an excellent beer for that is the Sierra Nevada Torpedo. That's a really good beer for, uh, I like to sear my brats first and then throw them in a beer bath. And in that beer bath, I'm going to put garlic and onion in it. So it doesn't really matter what kind of beer I put in it. Uh, none of it's going to hold up very well to the garlic and onions, but the the hops from the uh, from that torpedo do real well in in beer brats. Speaking of which, John, did you have a Lums up by you? Do you remember what? Lums? A Lums restaurant. I'm not familiar with it. They used to do uh, hot dogs steamed in beer. Oh yeah. Yeah, it's very popular down here and. It went by the wayside, but yeah, I used to, any hot dog you got was steamed in beer and they used different beers throughout the, the season. It could was you always taste, good. Could you taste any of that on the hot dog? Oh yeah, you could. Yeah. They, they had some, some pretty stout beers that they were using. Well, that's a good, I'm glad, I'm glad Anthony mentioned the brats because I think uh, with summertime rolling around here, it might be a good time to do a video, do a beer brought video. I haven't done that. And uh, Anthony says he's got some larceny. Oh, I'm 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 liking larceny. So, uh, oh, brand fourteen. I don't. I'm not familiar with that one. I don't know what that means actually. So, anyway, we're at, we're at our hour. I'm going to shut down, uh, guys. Uh, glad you could join us if you have any comments suggestions or requests for this line of uh live streaming let me know and uh we'll see you in a couple more weeks so guys y'all have a good one